Throughout the 12 year history of this show, I have been abundantly clear that there are very few vehicles when they go from generation to generation, they change their entire industry. Examples of leaders like this would be the Ford F-150, Porsche 911, and of course, the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. However, in moving to the W223 generation of S-Class, this ain't just about the way it drives or the way it looks. There's more going on underneath the skin here. And the only way to put this is let's you and I meet some of the technology that we're going to be driving for the next 10 years in this, as well as pretty much every other car on the road. Okay, so the first bit of flash tech you and I need to meet that's going to be impacting cars for the next 10 years, at least those with internal combustion engines, would be a 48 volt electrical system. Now, those of you that have been watching the show for a while are like, wait a minute, you go on and on about 48 volt electrical systems, particularly in Mercedes-Benz, what's new here? Well, the big difference here is it's paired with an eight cylinder engine in an S-Class powering all four wheels. Now, yes, there will be that three liter inline six in the S500. We will drive that in a future episode. Today, we're focusing on the S580. That's good for 496 horsepower and 516 pound-feet of torque. But more importantly, there is an integrated starter generator motor that sits between the transmission and the engine. That replaces the starter motor, the alternator, and the accessory drive, which sounds great, but what the hell does that mean to you and I, and why is it important? Well, the concept of less moving parts in an incredibly complex vehicle like an S-Class could translate to more reliability down the road, especially after five years of ownership. That provides assist when the car is, say, starting from a light or a stop sign. It also provides assist as the car is trying to pass in traffic. It also can coast the vehicle. So up to almost 100 miles an hour, the car can coast, so it does somewhat improve fuel economy to the point where it's 17, 25, 21 combined. Performance figures that also kind of helps here, zero to 60 in a vehicle that is over 200 inches long, like 208 to be exact, 4.4 seconds, and then VMAX, that sadly is electronic limited, 130 miles an hour. Something tells me when there is a real AMG engine in this thing, we won't have to worry about limiting anything with electronics. Right about now you're thinking, that's gotta be heavy. And you wouldn't necessarily be wrong, but it's not as heavy as you would think. 4,775 pounds, or depending on how you express your weights and measures, 2,166 kilograms. With that Sport Plus mode in a Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Oh yes, oh that goes. Very little hesitation. Man, this thing is downright fast, even though it is not the AMG yet. It picks up, really the switch comes on around 2000 RPM, but then it kind of explodes around 3,000, 3,500 RPM. Now the fascinating thing about that is the way this thing works in conjunction with the transmission. For the avoidance of doubt, the transmission is not a dual clutch system like it is in an AMG. This is the same nine speed torque converter automatic that we've driven in many other Mercedes. But here, at least with the programming changes in the Sport Plus mode, the engineers in Stuttgart have changed the way the cogs work. At least it feels that way. It feels different. It feels like it's more mechanical the way it shifts. It holds the gears significantly longer than other like different programming, mapping, whatever you want to call it for transmissions in these types of cars. However, when you switch it into comfort mode, I'm going to try to do this without killing us because if this is all, we'll get into this button stuff later and there we go. Comfort, push it a bit more aggressively and yeah, it starts to feel like an S-Class, but more importantly, when you drive this thing around town, at least in comfort mode, God, is it elegant. Okay, so let's put the different levels of urgency aside and switch into driving dynamics. And for that, let's go back into Sport Plus mode. Notice I am doing this 
when I'm slowing the vehicle down again. We'll get to those buttons and UX interaction a bit later. But here, a bit of a recap from the tech review. Multi-link in the front, multi-link in the rear, and air ride throughout. And that is fitted as standard. It's not like in a Porsche where you have to pay extra for a PDCC. And here, the result is unusually good. Again, like the way the car delivers power, it completely changes the characteristics of the way the vehicle drives. Like there is such a delta between Comfort and Sport Plus, you'd swear it's a different vehicle. Now, there are times when I'm pushing it very aggressively like we are here, and you do feel the 126.6 inch wheelbase. There's no way to hide that much length because really the wheels in that air ride, they're trying to work extra hard to control all the different planes of motion here. But this really isn't about pitch, squat, dive, or roll. This is more about ride quality. And I keep on coming back to this and driving this vehicle. This is something elegant. You and I spend a lot of time driving, you know, cool Porsches, even that Corvette or Lamborghini in these roads. But this, God, the way they've set up the ride quality, meaning it's not like driving your couch. Put another way, it's measured, it's controlled. Clearly all the engineering effort von Stuttgart has gone in making this thing work, but not punching you in the face with driver control or driving dynamics control. Now, as lovely as all that is, the thing you and I need to focus on is the steering. And no, it's not the usual, is it direct? Yes, it is. Is the weighting good? I would say actually better than one would expect. Clearly, the folks in Stuttgart have been watching these episodes. As I've been complaining about the weight of the steering in AMGs, so clearly they fixed it here, Wiel and Dank. Really, what's going on here? That four-wheel steering. It is incredible. Now, there are two different flavors on offer. There's the 10 degree, which sadly this car is not fitted with. And then there's the 4.5 degree. That's what this car has. And you immediately notice it from the time you stand outside the vehicle. When this thing turned up at the airport, I could see it working as they maneuvered the car around the hangar. But then you get behind the wheel of the car and my God, is it noticeable. Yeah, in like a parking lot, it's, it takes a 126 inch wheelbase car and brings it down to like 115. It's that kind of difference. But then when you push it more aggressively here, this is where we get that sharpness, at least in Sport Plus mode. It's almost to the point where you have to change where you do your turn-ins aggressively. And whoa, well, in that case, it didn't work so well. That's where the weight kind of overdid it there. But you see what I'm saying? Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game on the options game with today's contestant, arguably the most important Mercedes-Benz. That Mercedes-Benz makes an entirely new S-Class. This one, the 2022 Mercedes-Benz S580 formatic for a base price of $116,300. Now, before we press on to anything else, we do need to discuss the color. You see, when this first turned up on the airport grounds this morning, I thought for certain it was black. Then it started moving around in different lights, and that's when you realize just how emerald, emerald green is. And this is what we have to say, Wieland Dank. You see, this color, a metallic, does not cost extra. However, there is another piece we have to say Wieland Dank for, and that is the Sienna Brown with black two-tone Napa leather interior. Now it's more sienna brown than it is black. Anyway, we need to press on to one other item about the interior, the way it's dressed up. And you can't help but notice the piano lacquer flowing lines. It's a piano black trim, which I don't love because the OCD guy in me would go berserk with all of the piano black high gloss trim, the screens, even the piano black on the steering wheel I would spend all my time cleaning the interior of this car. And that is why I would highly suggest one would go with the satin finish wood that can also be had with the blowing lines. In this case, it is $1,300. We press on to the 20 inch AMG wheels, $750. I would say that is a bargain. Then an incredibly important option on this vehicle, the 4.5 degree rear axle steer for $1,300 then arguably the most important option, at least for me, ain't cheap, the Burmester 4D stereo system. And man, oh man, does this have to be good because it is 
$30. As a basis of comparison, it's about four to five grand in a portion. And we press it on to the warmth and comfort package. And this to me is what makes this an S-Class. Yeah, it includes the heated steering wheel and the heated and vented rear seats, but more importantly, it includes the power outboard adjustable rear seats. You see in the US, one cannot have the four place seating package like in Europe. Remember the car we saw in Long Beach about a year ago? That car had the console that went the length of the interior. That is not an offer, at least in a Mercedes S-Class in the US, in a Maybach, yes. Now there are some other niceties that this package brings to the table, like a heated center armrest in the front, and then for the rear passengers, there's a heated armrest in either outboard position. That combined with the fancy adjustable rear seats and all other stuff, $3,800. Then we press on to the 3D tech package. We will talk more about it later in this episode. It is incredibly cool. And then that combined with the 3D instrument cluster, well worth the $3,000. Then we press on to the AMG line package. Now, yes, we already paid for the AMG wheels. However, this is changing the body kit, like the bumper in the front, the bumper in the rear, as well as the side skirts. That's specific to more of an AMG look. It's not an AMG yet, but it's an AMG look, and that is $4,300. I don't know if I'd want that on an S-Class. Then the only other thing you and I would add would be the destination handling von Sindelfing in Deutschland for $1,050, which would bring us to a total price of $138,530. We have come to that point in the episode where we need to put aside the car geek business and focus on the start of the show, and that would be the interior. And here, from a very basic level, fit and finish, color and trim, tactile feel, all that kind of stuff, it far exceeds expectations. Now granted, we expect a lot from a Mercedes, but here, someone decided to bring this up a couple levels, even for an S-Class. Now, not everything is puppy dogs and roses you saw the tech review back in August, you know I have a problem with this. The UX design clearly has been taken from Tesla. I understand why they want to do that, because really the number one selling car in this class has been the Tesla Model S. However, that is not enough of a reason to completely change the paradigm of UX design. Now clearly, someone has been listening in Stuttgart because we saw the EQS, the electric version of an S-Class, totally different in terms of platform and design. But that interior, it has this stunning concave screen. It is wonderful to look at, and I would argue fixes kind of the sins here. With this, I don't think this design will age well. The screens in particular, I love the dashboard. Like back in the day, old school Ransom E old dashboard. But enough of my design nerd, let's focus on the issue at hand, and that is the interaction with the UX system. If you couldn't tell, everything is with a screen. There are a total of four hard buttons in the vehicle, and at that, the rest of the pseudo buttons are haptic feedback, even the button to control the sunroof. Now, you noticed earlier in the episode, I tried to switch this thing from Sport Plus to Comfort. And to do that, on a road, then I know like the back of my hand, I had to slow the vehicle down, take my eye off the road, go to this button down here that has no feel whatsoever, and then interact with the screen. That is not prudent. I know that all the kids these days love the Teslas with the screens here, but think about it. You look at the news, you look all over social, and what do you see? Many Teslas that have hit guardrails, basically total vehicles. And then there's the reality of, I spent a month in a hospital because someone in a Tesla Model X was looking here. That is my quarrel with this system. So rather than bitching and moaning, here are a couple of areas of suggestion. Suggestion number one, which would be the most important, and that is the introduction of some knobs. And here's the funny thing, you've already got them. Actually, quite elegant knobs, and they're placed in unusual places. Like for example, the start button is a knob for the vehicle. Then the headlight switch, it is on the door panel. You sit between the two knobs. It is a very elegant design touch. What I'd love to see is to take those knobs, same fitment, same piece, 
and put two or three of them down here. And the reason why I say that, use at least two of them, one here and one here to control the temperature on either side of the vehicle. And then ideally take a page out of Jaguar Land Rover. I know it's funny to say that in a Mercedes episode, but make them multifunction. Perhaps if you push and pull them, it adjusts the fan or even works in conjunction with other functions in the UX system. Then maybe bring in another third controller, put the knob here and have that be a unified controller. As much as you and I used to beat up on the BMW system, iDrive was terrible when it started, but they followed the old adage of be willing to do it badly, and now they're one of the best in the business. Okay, so enough with the bad and the ugly, let's focus on the good. In this case, it is extremely good. The 3D instrument cluster and the 3D slash augmented reality head-up display, this is otherworldly. Yeah, seeing it in that research and development facility in Long Beach last year, it was cool, it was neat, you could play around with it. It's kind of like a party trick. However, when you get behind the wheel of this thing and configure it to your personal taste, like right now, I've got it in sport mode, so it's got this very like 80s graphic 3D feel to it. Then there's the head-up display, and here it is both 3D as well as augmented reality depending on the setting. Now last year when we first saw this in Long Beach, I kind of joked that it's, oh, like a TV from Costco. But now that I've experienced it, I'm not joking. It is a television from Costco. It's about like 40 inch diagonal. That's the way it appears. And it sits about six to 10 feet in front of the vehicle. It is unlike any other head up display you and I have experienced ever in our lives. This kind of head up display technology is what will filter down into other cars. Let me put the augmented reality application within the head up display another way. It's kind of like that old Tom Cruise movie, Minority Report, where he would get on a screen that didn't exist. He would use these special gloves to move in and pinch into different parts to find the criminal or find the baddie. That's kind of what this system is. Although you don't have the gloves and you can't like pinch and zoom with your hands like you're in a sci-fi or Ridley Scott film, but it's the next best thing, at least in 2021. Full disclosure, Kumo and I expected this thing to be good. What we did not expect was for it to be this good. However, I need to append that statement with an asterisk. You see, there are two directions at play here. There's exceeding expectations, and then there is a challenge for the future. Let's start with exceeding expectations. You see, the driving dynamics here, combined with the way the thing is screwed together, combined with the implementation of super flash tech, like the rear wheel steer and Santa Maria Madre di Dios, the 3D augmented reality head up display. This, I had to think about a way to put this all together. And I promise you the following statement is not bullshit. This is the reinterpretation of elegance on four wheels for 2021. Now that brings us to the challenging part. And here, you know what I'm gonna say, it's that UX. But before I made the statement, I did a little research. You see the planes you see in these hangars, uh, that's a formation flying team. And most of the guys, they're older. Uh, exactly the demographic for this type of vehicle. So I took one of them and forced him to drive it. Did not give him a tutorial. He failed miserably, couldn't get it to work. And frankly, like I say, voice isn't there yet. And so it's the combination of my driving experience with this thing and my sorta impromptu focus group that brings us to the wish list. This new interpretation or paradigm of Mercedes-Benz UX for the next 10 years absolutely positively needs knobs, real buttons, scroll wheel, and perhaps five-way controllers. Here's a couple of examples. Think about putting a weighty aluminum knob through the glass in this thing and even have a bezel that's chrome or it could be customized with wood or leather to really enhance the elegance of this vehicle. And then on the steering wheel, really need to change the controllers because the haptic capacitive touch, it only works like one in four times. I'm thinking that's where you need the thumb wheel and perhaps a five-way controller. And again, can put in some weight in there to really drive home the point of the elegance and the safety. 
And this is the point of the episode where I turn this around to you guys to opine in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV, all one word, Moto Man TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I do want to leave you with one kind of behind the scenes thing here. Uh, the new CEO of Mercedes Benz North America, I am very proud to announce, is a fellow Greek man. He is from Crete. And uh, while we were there, you guys know I'm a cigar man. Uh, we fellowshipped over a cigar and talk the island of Crete and the city of Athens. Until I see you in the next episode, bish beta.